This presentation is designed to cover the topics of instrumentation and electronics to facilitate an understanding of these concepts in relation to recording of physiological activity such as EEG. computer says I need to upgrade my brain to understand this next presentation. That, by the way, is not meant as an insult. It's simply a, a statement that this next presentation can be somewhat complicated, and so it may be helpful to review this uh, more than one time. We're going to start by talking about how we measure the EEG. We're going to talk about differential amplifiers, common mode rejection, and montages. Differential amplifiers multiply signals that are the same and signals that are different between two inputs by different but constant factors. If you remember from our example from the electricity presentation, we record the electrical activity, the voltage differential, between the active sensor on the scalp and a system reference or system ground. And this electrical difference is then also compared to another measurement of electrical difference from another electrode, again compared to the system reference or system ground. So that gives us two identical inputs into the amplifier identical in terms of their, physio or their electrical characteristics, except that one is positive and one is negative. However, the differences are in what is being recorded at each location. So we take two inputs, compare them both to the common ground or reference, and we compare the two to each other, and we multiply signals between those two inputs that are the same, and signals that are different between those two inputs by different but constant factors. And that means that, for example, anything that's different between those two inputs is multiplied by a larger number, sometimes 10, sometimes 100, sometimes 1,000. And the signals or waves that are common to both of those inputs are multiplied by a small number, usually 1. Here's an example. We have a common signal that, sorry, we have a common signal that is the same in both inputs. In this input, we have an additional signal that possibly is our signal of interest, and we want to put that through our differential amplifier where we record the activity and multiply anything that's the same by one and anything that's different by 10, and that attenuates the common signal or blocks the common signal to a certain extent or rejects it, and it amplifies the signal of interest. So we can see that the common signal has been significantly decreased while the interesting signal from this one input has been amplified quite significantly. We have improved the signal to noise ratio because we assume that anything that's common to both inputs is some sort of extraneous noise, usually environmental noise like the 60 hertz artifact that we talked about in the electricity presentation. So again, this is called a differential amplifier. It's differentially multiplying signals that are the same and signals that are different between two inputs by different con but constant factors. And I'm going to show you more examples of that. So we've improved the signal to noise ratio from 0 0.1 to 10. So 0 0.1 to 1 to 10 to 1. So a significant improvement in the amplification of the signal against the noise. That gives us our common mode rejection ratio. The ratio of the differential gain to the common mode gain. And in this example that difference is 10 to 1. So the common mode rejection ratio in this example is 10 to 1. 
So here we have the input uh, from a scalp sensor, for example. This may be from an ear reference, and then we have a ground reference connected to some other location, possibly the other ear of the client. And we compare these two inputs, which are both individually compared to the ground reference. Uh, that's where they come from, is a comparison between this and the ground reference, and between this and the ground reference. Then we're comparing those two inputs to each other, and the output to the amplifier is a single output that represents the difference between these two inputs. Okay. Now, because we have these three sensors for every circuit, we have choices about how we're going to put these sensors on the scalp surface. Those are called mounting choices or montage choices. And so the montage is a choice between where to put the sensors in any particular combination on the scalp surface. Now, if we have multiple inputs, for example, let's say we have 19 electrodes on the scalp, they're all being compared initially to the system ground or system reference that we talked about early. Now, common mode rejection is sensitive primarily to phase. And by phase, we mean are the waves waving at the same time, which would mean they are in phase? Or are they waving at opposite times, or some other relationship that is not synchronous? And that would be out of phase. When two waves are in phase, then they are more likely to be rejected because they look very similar to the amplifier. If they're out of phase, they're looking very different to the amplifier. Even though the waves are actually identical, they're not waving at the same time. So because of the timing difference, the waves are both being retained rather than rejected. Now, common mode rejection is also somewhat sensitive to amplitude. If the amplitude is significantly different, then both of these waves will be retained. If the amplitude is the same and the waves are synchronous, then they're going to be rejected. In this example, the waves are synchronous, but the amplitude is significantly different, and therefore they look different to the amplifier, and components of those waves will be retained. So this is the function of common mode rejection, primarily looking at the waves themselves and to see which ones are waving at the same time. Now, this was, of course, invented initially to uh, reject the mains artifact, which is the electrical artifact from the electricity running through the walls and ceilings of your room and permeating the environment with a 60 hertz artifact or 60 cycles per second uh, electrical noise from the electromagnetic fields that exist in the environment and will show up in your EEG. So the amplifier looks at the incoming signal and it figures that if there are waves that are happening very uh, synchronously and at the same amplitude at two different inputs, then they're likely to be related to this 60 hertz or in Europe or Asia 50 hertz uh, electrical signal from the electrical activity in the environment. Now the amplitude issue is uh, one of uh, um, somewhat some importance because, for example, if you have a source of 60 hertz artifact on one side of the client and you have a sensor on that side, and then you have a source that's farther away from the client on the other side of the client, and you have a sensor on that side, the amplitude might look different even though the waves are the same, even though it's 60 hertz artifact. If the amplitude is significantly different, then again, those two signals will be retained, and you'll see higher examples of 60 hertz artifact. Sometimes just rotating the client uh, in their chair a, a little bit in relation to the electromagnetic field will improve common mode rejection. So that gives us choices about where we're going to put the placement, the electrode placement, because we have these three sensors. We have a positive electrode, that's a positive input. We often call the, that the active sensor. We have a negative input that we often call the reference sensor, although that becomes confusing because the ground is also called the reference. And this is our ground reference sensor for the system. 
So we're comparing this sensor to this sensor when we're coming up with an input into the amplifier and, and that the amplifier can use to calculate common mode rejection. We have this sensor also compared to the same reference and then that input goes into the amplifier. The amplifier can compare these two to each other and come up with a result that it represents the difference between the two. Now, this is called a referential or monopolar montage, which means one active sensor is on the scalp and the other active sensor is on a neutral site, like the earlobe, for example, or the mastoid bone. And some people even suggest putting the reference sensor on the tip of the nose. Uh, the expectation here is that what we're seeing on the computer screen as a result of common mode rejection, following common mode rejection, represents the activity right underneath this electrode at C3 here. And that there is very little, if any, uh, electrical activity that is real EEG activity coming from this ear reference and therefore the activity seen on the computer screen is reliably the activity underneath this sensor. Obviously again compared to the initial uh, ground reference. So we can be fairly certain not perfectly certain but fairly certain that the activity in a monopolar or referential montage is representing the activity under this positive sensor and the activity under the negative sensor is not contributing EEG activity. Uh, we'll see that that's not always the case and I'll show you some examples of that. But generally speaking this gives us some confidence that what we're seeing here is the result of this active sensor. Now there's another kind of montage called a sequential or bipolar montage which is comparing these two sensors to each other. Now that's also true in this case uh, of the monopolar montage, but we assume that this is producing uh, little or no EEG activity. In this case we have both sensors over active EEG producing electrode sites, and therefore this electrode is picking up real EEG and this electrode is picking up real EEG, and so therefore the result on the computer uh, that we see as a, a result of common mode rejection reflects the difference between these two electrically active sites. And the problem with that is that as the electrodes get closer and closer to each other, the EEG waveforms that are seen in each of these inputs is going to be very similar the closer they become to each other. And therefore some of that activity, if it's highly synchronous, will be rejected and the only things that will be retained are that which is different between these two locations. Now that can be very useful when you're trying to localize uh, abnormal electrical activity. Uh, the farther away you get from that abnormal electrical activity, uh, the more distinctive the difference is between this site and the then comparison site, or reference site if you will. But essentially you don't know what is representing which part of this location in, in a simple two sensor hookup. If you have 19 sensors on the scalp then you could compare this sensor to this sensor and this sensor to the sensor over here and this sensor to a sensor up here and you can make multiple comparisons and that would help you isolate the location of an abnormal pattern for example. In this example we just have two scalp sensors and therefore the end result that shows up on the computer screen is the difference between these two sensors, but each of them is producing EEG activity, and so the resulting signal on the computer screen represents the difference in EEG activity at each location and does not represent one or the other. It just represents a combination of both and the difference between the two. So anything that's common to both inputs, whether it's 60 Hz artifact, or real EEG, for example, an alpha rhythm might look very similar at these two locations and therefore that possibly would be rejected in favor of more asynchronous patterns such as those seen in the beta frequency bands. Now when we're looking at longitudinal uh, bipolar montage, again this is a sequential montage which means it's representing a sequence of electrode connections 
uh, comparing one to the other. So we start out with FP1 being compared to F7, F7 to T3, T3 to T5, T5 to O1, and then we go back up here uh, to FP1 compared to F3, F3 to C3, C3 to P3, P3 to O1. This is called the longitudinal bipolar montage. So it's, a, it's going in the long axis and it's bipolar, meaning uh, adjacent electrodes are being compared to each other sequentially. That's why it's also called a sequential montage. We do the same thing on the left as we do on the right hemisphere, and then we also do the midline here. Now there are other schemes for this numbering system or comparison system. As you see here, we have uh, FP1 compared to F3 first instead of uh, F7. And then we go through this sequence, and then we go through the same inside sequence on the right side, and then we go back to the left side for the outer sequence, and then the outer sequence on the right, and then we do the midline. And that's perfectly fine, although this is a more standard approach uh, to the longitudinal bipolar montage. It is often called the double banana montage because it looks like a couple of bananas on your head, and some people even call this the banana split. Uh, what this does for you is it allows you to compare multiple sensors to uh, each other in a series or a combination, and then you can use other uh, combinations to fine-tune your localization of abnormal activity. For example, uh, here's a, an example of activity recorded with linked ears. Now you can't read these numbers and letter combinations here over here on the left um, unless possibly you can expand your screen uh, but what we have here is FP1 compared to uh, F7 and then we have F... I'm sorry, we have com FP1 compared to the linked ears, we have F uh, P2 compared to the linked ears, we have F3 compared to the linked ears uh, uh, sorry, F7, F3, Fz, F4, F8, and so on. So these are the frontal sensors essentially, and these are the occipital sensors here, O1 and O2. Uh, sorry, uh, these are the central electrodes here, C3 and C4, and we have the occipital in the back uh, uh, here. Uh, so we are going essentially from front to back, and we have the temporal sensors here, uh, some parietal sensors mixed in. And so what we're seeing is a very similar waveform at multiple locations. And again, this is all referenced to the linked ears. So each electrode on the scalp surface is referenced to the ear lobes linked together. And so they're uh, being used as a common reference. It's called a common reference and they're adding the two electrodes from the ears together and they're coming up with a common value which then is used in the common mode rejection process uh, as a way of cleaning out uh, the noise out of the uh, signal. Now the problem with that is that in some cases we'll have contributions from the reference sensors. It's called reference contamination and what it means is that the reference sensor is producing electrical activity that is actual EEG. Sometimes uh, particularly the alpha activity in the temporal lobes is strong enough to come through the tissues of the ear and show up in the ear reference sensor sometimes on one side sometimes on the other side. Um, usually if it's in both then they gets canceled out but if it's only in one side particularly then it's going to be contributed to the other sensors that don't show that activity. Remember, anything that's different gets retained. Anything that's the same gets rejected. So this activity is not really present in these frontal electrodes, but because it's present in the ear reference electrode that these are being compared to, it's being contributed uh, to these frontal sensors. It's called reference contamination. Now if we look at this in a bipolar montage, we see that essentially this is coming from the T4, T6 combination, and we really don't see it otherwise. This is the same exact recording, just showing it as a bipolar montage or a sequential montage rather than as a linked ears montage. 
So in this example, we see the linked ears and the presence of this activity. We take the ears out of the mix. We completely eliminate them from this comparison. And we're not using the ear reference here at all. And we come up with this finding here where that little wiggle activity here is really coming from this T6 or T4 sensor. And then it's being, it's leaking through, if you will, into the ear sensor and being contributed to the frontal electrodes as reference contamination. So keep that in mind, that just because you're seeing something on your computer screen doesn't mean that it really exists at those locations. Always check uh, what you're looking at with multiple montages so you can actually identify what's really there and what's not really there. Now here are a couple of more act, uh, examples of this. Uh, here we have uh, brain activity, more similar when the electrodes are closer to we, uh, together, as we mentioned, less similar when the electrodes are farther apart. Now that causes rejection of real EEG in adjacent electrodes. So here we have an example of FP1 compared to FP2. Now because they're very close to each other, a lot of the slower activity, which might be present, we don't know, is being uh, rejected and what we have is a fairly fast low voltage pattern here. Uh, we assume, we don't know, but we assume that there's a fair amount of rejection of similar waveforms. Now if we compare FP1 to FP1, we're comparing the same sensor to itself, then we should have a completely flat line if common mode rejection is functioning correctly. That means that the activity at FP1 being compared to the activity at FP1 is identical and therefore all of it is being rejected. This is what you should see in your system if you're comparing one sensor to itself. Now if we compare FP1 to O2, those locations are about as far apart as you can get. Uh, FP1 is up in the left front of the forehead and O2 is in the occipital lobe way in the back of the head. So now we're seeing multiple different waveforms that may be coming from FP1 and some of them may be coming from O2, we don't know. So let's take a look at those independently. Here we have the FP1 electrode uh, compared to the linked ears. And so we're comparing FP1 to the linked ears. Here we have O2 compared to the linked ears. And so we're comparing both sensors to the same reference. So here we have FP1 compared to the linked ears and we see this feature appearing right here. But that feature, this wiggly EEG pattern here, does not show up in the same, uh, at the same time period in the O2 electrode. So this is different. Now here we have a, an activity pattern that's showing up only at the O2 electrode, but does not show up at the FP1 electrode. If we compare FP1 to O2, now we see that this part is showing up in the combination result and this is showing up in the combination result as well. So this feature from the FP1 electrode is being added to the composite signal and this activity that's showing up only in the O2 electrode is now being contributed to the composite signal. So FP1 compared to O2 is the result of the combination of the two EEG patterns. Anything that's different gets retained, whether it's coming from O2 or whether it's coming from FP1. So again, we cannot trust this com combined signal to represent anything particularly at one location or the other because we don't know where it's coming from. We just know that this is the combination of those two electrodes. And as I said before, if we normally have 19 sensors on the scalp, we can look at adjacent electrodes and see where this electrode ac electrical activity is coming from. Now, as we're measuring this EEG on the scalp service, surface, we're measuring what's called analog information. We're just showing voltage changes. We're measuring voltage changes on the scalp surface in relation to the two uh, input electrodes compared to the system reference or system ground. Now, there is an analog to digital conversion system called an analog to digital converter that converts this these voltage changes into ones and zeros. And this is done through a signal processing uh, 
uh, mechanism in the amplifier following common mode rejection. So first we have column, common mode rejection, then we uh, put that uh, resulting signal into this sample and hold circuit. It converts it into ones and zeros, which then are represented by a, a series of um, n number combinations. Uh, zero, 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 representing zero in this particular example. Zero, one, zero, one, representing this voltage. Zero, uh, one, 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 representing this voltage, and so on. So each voltage step is represented by a combination of ones and zeros uh, in the binary language of computers. Computers use ones and zeros as their language. And so that's called the binary language of computers. And this binary language is uh, uh, what is needed to send to the computer so the computer can use that information uh, to process the data and represent that back as a waveform on your computer screen. Now this process requires that we sample the data at a certain frequency. That means we sample the data often enough so that we get an accurate representation of the actual signal that we're measuring. So this is called the sample rate, and I mentioned this before in the uh, uh, presentation on electricity. The sample rate is the number of measures taken within a given time period. And usually that time period is one second. So for example, a common EEG amplifier is going to sample 256 samples per second. 256 measurements of that data per second and then that's processed through the analog to digital conversion mechanism. The sample rate must be high enough to accurately represent the signal being measured. This is called the Nyquist principle or the Nyquist theorem. And that states that the sample rate must be at least two times as fast as the signal being measured. So if, if we want to measure a 10 hertz or 10 waves per second alpha signal, we have to measure that 20 times per second to get an accurate representation. That's the Nyquist principle or Nyquist theorem. That's the question you're going to get on the exams that you might take, the BCIA exam or the QEEG exam, and that's the answer that you should give is two times the signal being measured. The sample rate must be at least two times the signal being measured. Now in reality we generally sample much more much faster than that because we get a better representation of the signal. Now why do we do this? If we don't sample fast enough we get what's called an alias signal. It's called aliasing. So here we're sampling this uh, 10 Hertz signal at 12 samples per second. And this is a half a second so there are only six samples in this half a second period of time. So we're sampling this this waveform here. This represents the 10 Hertz signal this wavy line. This is sampling one, two, three, four, five, six times per second. That's ten cycles per, uh, sorry, per half second. And that means that we're ending up with too few samples and we're only representing little bits of this waveform and we end up with a signal that looks much slower than the real waveform. That's called an alias signal and it's a result of sampling too slow. Now here we're sampling the same 10 hertz signal at 19 times per second. So we have 19 measurements, but you can see that because we're not sampling 20 times per second, we end up getting off and under-representing the waveform itself. So we end up with an alias signal after all. Here we're sampling 100 times per second. So sampling 100 times per second of a 10 hertz signal is obviously 10 times as fast as the signal being measured and we get a very very precise representation of that signal. Now if we sample at 200 waves per second, 200 samples per second, the same 10 hertz or 10 waves per second signal, we get an even more accurate representation of that signal. Now this is called oversampling and typically EEG amplifiers sample at four times as fast as the signal being uh, viewed. So for example a 10 hertz signal would be sampled at a minimum of 40 samples per second. And as I've mentioned already 
a typical sample rate for most EEG systems is 256 samples per second, which means that we can see a 64 hertz signal pretty clearly because we have four times oversampling. But again, the answer for, this, for the test would be that the Nyquist principle states that the sampling rate has to be two times the signal being measured, even though the common practice is to sample much faster than that. Now subsequent processing occurs in the software using transforms, and one of the most common transforms to transform the complicated signal or the complex signal into its component uh, frequency and amplitude information is called the Fourier transform. Now the Fourier transform was developed by a French mathematician and then subsequently it was speeded up so now it's called the fast Fourier transform but the transform itself to transform the complex signal into its component parts of frequency and amplitude is called a Fourier transform. Now there are multiple other transforms another common one that's used uh, that's a little bit more modern and a little faster is called the Hilbert transform and that's commonly used in z-score training for example uh, because it is uh, something that can be used for very fast feedback whereas the Fourier transform requires a minimum of one second of data to calculate an output the Hilbert transform is much faster now other mechanisms for converting that complex signal into component parts are digital filters and there are a variety of those uh, digital filter types and ways of uh, calculating them. So let's talk about EEG brainwaves now that we've talked about how we measure these EEG brainwaves. Let's talk about the brainwaves themselves. And let's talk a little bit about the terminology that we use. So some of the terminology that we use include frequency, which we've already talked about a little bit, amplitude, power, percent power, or relative power, which these reflect the same thing. Percent power and relative power mean the same thing. Wavelength, correlation coefficient, phase, synchrony, coherence and co-modulation. Converting the raw EEG into frequency bands through analog to digital conversion is similar to what happens when we look at a raw white light being shined into a prism which breaks it up into the different frequency bands of light. Different colors of light of course are different frequencies of light. When we look at the EEG we're looking at the EEG signal as a raw tracing in this top graph and then broken out into the different frequency bands separately and independently uh, in these separate EEG frequency maps. Uh, this is delta 1 to 4 hertz, this is theta 4 to 8 hertz, this is alpha 8 to 12 and beta 13 to 21 waves per second. So all of this information down here is contained in this signal up here. And we can see by the scale, uh, though you may not be able to read that scale, this is a negative 50 to positive 50 scale. So 100 microvolts between the, the bottom and the top of this scale with zero in the middle. Now for these individual bands, we're looking at um, a scale of 50 microvolts total, so negative 25 to positive 25 again with zero in the middle. So each of these is on a 50 microvolt scale. Uh, to contain the whole entire signal we need to be on a 100 microvolt scale. Uh, so this information here is contained in this signal up here. If you were an electroencephalographer or a neurologist you would be likely to be able to read this raw signal and discern the different frequency bands within this raw signal. But for our purposes and as beginners it's much more helpful to break these out into different frequency bands so that we can see them uh, individually and more clearly. So when we're talking about the term or the concept of frequency it's a simple concept. It essentially means that we're looking at how frequently does the wave occur in a one second period of time. 
that's frequency. How frequently does it wave? The number of peaks or zero crossings divided by two. So here we count the number of peaks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and a half. That gives us nine and a half waves per second. Now, if we were to count the zero crossings, it's 19, and we divide that by 2. That gives us the same, 9.5 waves per second. It's just a different way of calculating it. But basically, that tells us the frequency of this waveform. How frequently is it waving? Now, amplitude is the amount of electrical activity in this same signal. In this case, it's an 8 to 11 hertz signal, or 8 to 12 hertz signal. Uh, how much is there, how big is it, how much energy is in that signal being measured, and we display that in microvolts, which are millions of a volt. Now we do this usually using the peak-to-peak -peak method, where we look at the peak in the positive value and the peak to the negative value, and we look at the difference between those two. So again, we have 0 in the middle, we have negative 10, we have positive 10, so the difference between this positive 10 and negative 10 is 20 microvolts peak to peak. That's called the peak to peak method. There are other methods. But essentially we're measuring what uh, the voltage, the amount of electrical activity in this signal at that given moment in time. Now there's another measurement that we might use if we were to average this amplitude, this voltage over this one second period of time. That would be called magnitude. So magnitude is the measure of the voltage over a period of time. Now measuring amplitude, again we usually use the peak-to-peak -peak method, so we're looking at the positive peak to the negative peak and calculating that value. We can also use just the peak amplitude, which is measuring from the zero up to the positive value. We're not taking into account any of the negative values in that calculation. And we can also use the root mean square, which is also calculating above the zero line, but it's using a square root of the average of the squared values of the waveform. It's a little bit more precise and is sometimes used and then converted to the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude, as is hap what happens in the Biotrace software. Now, the other thing that we do measure is the wave period the, the wavelength, how long it takes the wave to occur. And if we're looking at wavelength, a one cycle per second wave, one hertz, each of those waves would take 1,000 milliseconds to occur, so one second for that one cycle per second wave to occur. If we have a wave that takes 13 seconds, uh, sorry, uh, 13 hertz, so there's 13 waves per seconds, then we have a 77 millisecond wave. Each of those waves takes 77 milliseconds to occur. Now when we're looking at the signal, we're looking at a, a, a combination of two factors. One is the gain that happens in the amplifier, and the other is the sensitivity setting that we make on our computer screen. So it's a sensitivity. This is too sensitive. We're seeing too much data kind of all mushed together we don't get to see much detail, much differentiation. This is about right. We see good detail uh, without being overwhelmed by detail, and here we don't have enough detail at all. We're seeing just completely flat lines uh, because we have a resolution that is uh, not sensitive enough. And so this is a sensitivity setting that we just set in the software on our computer. Usually it's just one button click that makes it more or less sensitive. And again, what we want to be able to do is see each individual wave and the waveforms in those waves uh, with enough detail so we can see some information, but not so much detail that we're overwhelmed by that information and can't pick out the different features of each waveform. As I said, gain is something that happens in the amplifier. It's the amplifier's ability to increase or boost the magnitude of an input signal to create a higher voltage output signal. It's rated as a ratio of output to input. It's different for AC systems and DC systems, but you don't have to worry about that. Uh, you won't be tested on that. Uh, an amplifier that produces a 1 millivolt output from a 1 microvolt signal has a gain of 1,000. And so sometimes you'll see 
amplifier sp uh, specifications, they'll include the, the gain value of the amplifier, how much it can boost the signal. Now when we define the signal, we, we, we went, we'll go back here to these uh, initial uh, brain waves and we see that we've got the raw signal and then we're breaking it out into the different frequency bands. How do we do that? Well, we use a uh, filtering process and these are digital filters in this particular case and uh, we use a combination of filters. We start with a high pass filter in this case. The high pass filter in this case is set at 1 hertz and it's called a high pass filter because it only passes those values that are above the setting of the filter. So we've set this at 1 hertz. We're, we're passing or including activity that's above 1 hertz and blocking anything that's below 1 hertz. Then we have a low pass filter which blocks everything above the setting of the filter and passes everything below it. So it's called a low pass filter. In this example, 4 hertz is our low pass filter. So we're including the two together in our band pass filter from 1 to 4 hertz. 1 hertz is our high pass filter, 4 hertz is our low pass filter, the combination is our band pass filter, sometimes also called a pass band filter, just to be difficult. The order of the filter is the number of samples that's held in memory to be used in the calculation. More samples gives you greater accuracy but slower speed. And when we're using these filters for training purposes, we want fast response filters. And so we're using something around a third order filter in most cases, which holds three samples in memory before calculating an output to the screen. Uh, if we want to do analysis, for example, offline, we might want to use a higher order filter to give us more precision. So here are three band pass filters, delta, theta, alpha, 1 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 12 hertz. This is an example of a raw signal. Again, we have zero in the middle. Uh, we have positive values and negative values. It's called a raw signal because it's minimally filtered. In this particular case, it's a 1 to 64 hertz filter, bandpass filter. And so we're only seeing, uh, we're seeing all the information in the EEG that's of interest to us, at least at this point. Now, being a raw signal, it has zero in the middle, positive and negative values. And that's what we're seeing up here in this alpha uh, band fast filter, 8 to 12 hertz. We get to see the bursting pattern. We see the voltage changes from positive to negative. This is sampled at 256 samples per second, so we're getting a precise representation of the signal. We also then uh, can convert that signal into a amplitude signal, where we've calculated these bursts as values that are all above the zero line. So here our Y scale starts at zero, whereas here our Y scale starts at negative 25 and goes up to positive 25. Here we're starting at zero and going up to 50. So it's the same scale, 50 microvolt scale, but in this case all the values are positive. And so we're representing each one of these bursts as a composite value, if you will. And so that composite value, this burst down here, shows this burst up here. Now this lower graph is being sampled at 32 samples per second. So we're sampling this data that's already been sampled at 256 samples. We're looking at it 32 times a second to see our voltage changes as positive values. And this is very helpful for training purposes because it's easier to drive a bar graph with this kind of a signal, a positive value signal. Now we talked about the Fourier transform. So here we have a raw signal, and this is a digitally filtered signal in this particular example. But here we're taking the raw signal and we're converting it 
using a Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform breaks this down into frequency, which is along the x-axis, and amplitude information. And what we have here is sometimes called a spectral display. It's also sometimes called a histogram display. And what it does is it shows each individual frequency as a series of vertical bar graphs. So individual frequency bands, remember band pass, are represented by a different color in this particular case. And the movement of these bars up and down represents the changes that are happening up here in this raw signal. But it's plotted in a different way. So it makes it easier for a beginner to look at this and see information, whereas if you were to look at this up here, it would be more difficult to derive information from it. Now that's a muscle artifact. That's the person clenching their teeth or swallowing or something. That's not a burst of electrical activity in the brain. It's simply a muscle artifact. We also see eye movement and eye blink artifacts occasionally here in this signal. Uh, so when we see this delta activity come up here, it's usually because of eye movement or eye blink artifact and not real delta activity. So each of these vertical bars represents 1 hertz. For example, in here, this bar represents 10 hertz. And it's moving up and down because it's being calculated one time per second. There's a calculation that's happening one time per second. Now, it's being updated more frequently than that. It's being um updated as a composite value of one second's worth of data, but it's uh, plotted to the screen more frequently than that because it uses something called a sliding window, where they take a snapshot of this data and then move the window just a little bit and take the snapshot, which includes a lot of the previous data, but also some new data, and then they keep sliding that window open and over and taking snapshots and calculating that data over and over again. But it is calculating on the basis of one second's worth of data. So it's not happening in real time, it's happening delayed by one second. But this is a useful display to see what the dominant frequency is, for example, and how the distribution shows up, and if there's a lot of activity in the faster frequencies, it's also very important when you're watching this signal to always be watching the raw signal because if you weren't watching the raw signal you might think that that burst of activity was real brain activity whereas if you're watching the raw signal you can tell that it's actually muscle artifact. Now here we have two different spectral displays. This is representing magnitude and as I mentioned earlier magnitude is a calculation of an average of a period of time, usually one second's worth of data. And so it's uh, the value over time, amplitude over time. Now we've squared that value, and this is called a power spectrum. And it's the amplitude or magnitude squared and plotted on the same kind of a graph. Now one thing you'll notice is that in the power spectrum you'll see greater differentiation between the different frequency bands. Whereas here they seem a little bit more similar, here we see greater differentiation. And that's one of the reasons that we use the power calculation. The other thing that squaring the value does is it gets rid of the negative sign and creates all positive values. So back in the day, that's what they used it for. Now the next thing we have is a display of, uh, again, this is 8 to 12 hertz and alpha, and this is magnitude, so this is amplitude over time, and this is power. Now at this point, this marker here, this person's going to close their eyes and we're going to see a real distinct change in this EEG. Uh, the person closes their eyes, they see a voltage increase in alpha amplitude and also a power increase in alpha amplitude. Now down here what we have is percent power. Percent power takes the power value of this particular frequency band, 8 to 12 hertz, and it compares it to the power value of the EEG as a whole. So the EEG as a whole, let's say, is 1 to 45 hertz and maybe has a value of 100. Well, let's say that this alpha amp uh, power is a value of 25. And so if we compare the, the power value, 
of alpha to the EEG as a whole, we end up with a value of 25% given that example. Now what we're seeing here is that we're starting out with a value of about 25%, and I know you probably can't read that Y scale, uh, but this is 25%, and then when the person closes their eyes, the power value goes up to uh, close to 100%, actually around around 75% of the EEG is now in the 8 to 12 hertz frequency band, and that's what happens generally when people close their eyes, is that there's a significant increase in both the amplitude, but also in the power, of course, because it's derived from amplitude, but also in the percentage of activity in the EEG that's represented in the alpha frequency band. So percent power, also sometimes called relative power, also called normalized EEG, is a percentage of the total EEG represented in this EEG frequency band. So again, if we watch this, we can see the uh, amplitude or magnitude. We see the power and relative power. And so we'll see all of these go up but at different rates because the power value is uh, squared, of course, and the percentage is representing a percentage. Now, we talked about polarization of the electrode. And this is, again, an electrical um, electronics instrumentation sort of measure that we want to pay attention to because when we're measuring the connection of our uh, electrodes to the scalp surface, we want to be careful that we're using an alternating current to test those connections. So we're looking at impedance rather than resistance. And so if we use a direct current, we're going to end up with polarized electrodes. The current flow across the connection from the electrode in the tissue, the current carries positive electrical ions into the more negative part of the junction and negative ions to the more positive part. That buildup of electrons, of ions, polarizes the electrode so it favors current flow in one direction, resists that flow in another direction. Again, this is caused by a direct current causing the flow of current only in one direction and setting up this polarization of the electrode. So we want to avoid that by using an alternating current to test our connections. Now, the same basic effect can uh, result from bias potentials, which are a buildup of electrons or mineral ions in a particular location for a variety of reasons. Sometimes you have uh, a problem with your connection. Sometimes you are using multiple different uh, electrode materials. For example, uh, you're using tin and gold and silver electrodes all on the same circuit, and because they all have different electrical properties, you're going to end up with a significantly different uh, current value between those three and you'll get current flow in between those electrode materials causing you to have bias potentials. Um, and that will block the easy and, and uh, clean flow of that electrical activity. Now when we're prepping this the client for applying our, our sensors we want to use the most minimally invasive preparation technique that we can get away with because we don't want to have to sterilize everything to the degree that would be required if we're breaking the scalp surface. So non-critical is the one we want to be in, which means we're touching intact skin. Now back in the old days, uh, we had to do everything up to and including poking holes in people's scalp uh, with a needle to get a good connection. Now that's no longer necessary because of the quality of the amplifiers that are available these days. If anybody tells you that you have to be below 5 kilo ohms of impedance to have a good signal, uh, they're completely inaccurate. There are several articles on your flash drive uh, and on the participant hub that explain why these values of, of below po uh, 5 kilo ohms of impedance are not necessary anymore and values of around 20 to 30 kilo ohms of resistance or impedance are quite suitable. Uh, which means we're going to prep the skin with simple uh, um, 
uh, alcohol pad to remove any um, skin surface cells and oils but we're not going to break the skin we're not going to abrade the skin and very definitely we're not going to poke holes in the skin now when we're doing EEG recording one of the things we will have to pay most attention to is uh, that there are artifacts present in all EEG recordings there's no way to get away from it common artifacts include physiological artifacts and exogenous artifacts and we'll talk about both of those the physiological artifacts include eye blink eye movement muscle artifact pulse artifact heartbeat artifact and electrodermal artifact non-physiological artifacts include movement both the clients movement and movement around the client in some cases electrode artifacts 60 Hertz artifacts field effect artifacts and instrument related artifacts here's an example of some artifacts now this is a just a very basic background signal this is coming from uh, FP1 electrode and this is coming from the O2 electrode and we've got a pretty clean signal uh, a basic fairly low amplitude background signal now I've got the scale set pretty low so that we can see the the artifacts that show up now we're going to see eye blink artifacts coming from this FP1 electrode that won't show up very much in the O2 electrode you see that's a very distinctive eye blink artifact there's another eye blink artifact but when we see muscle artifact caused by clenching the jaw we see it showing up pretty consistently in both electrodes again the eye blink artifacts don't show up much in the O2 electrode because it's too far away from the frontal eye fields and the eye artifacts are the result of the rotation of the eyeball it's not a muscle artifact it's a discharge of electrical activity from the eyeball itself which is a dipole meaning it has positive and negative characteristics electrically uh, and when the eyeball rotates those positive and, elect and negative electrical charges interact and produce a very large electrical signal that shows up in the delta frequency band of your EEG now you might get fooled into thinking it's delta but it's not it's simply the rotation of the eyeball producing a very large signal the muscle artifact as we saw produces a very fast signal and quite high amplitude in comparison with the EEG as a whole because muscles produce a lot of electrical activity at a much faster frequency than uh, brain waves do so we'll see muscle artifact here coming up pretty quick and you can see the higher amplitude and the faster frequency meaning the waves are packed more closely together that's a faster frequency higher amplitude means more voltage more electrical activity now here's an example of an eye artifact this is eye flutter where the person is blinking 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 repetitively very quickly for a period of time it may look like a seizure in the EEG but it's not uh, for a variety of reasons but it's definitely an eye movement uh, effect and you can see it because it's showing up in the frontal eye fields and not anywhere else in the EEG certainly not in the temporal and, and occipital electrodes uh, here's a pulse artifact now a pulse artifact is a mechanical artifact it's not an electrical artifact per se it's because the electrode is over a blood vessel and every time uh, the pulse goes through that blood vessel um, it causes a deflection of that uh, electrode away from the scalp surface it actually physically pushes the electrode up and it causes a change in the uh, electrical field that that electrode is picking up and it's related to the pulse now if you notice here this is the actual recorded EKG heartbeat and you can see that this pulse wave is a little bit delayed because it takes a little bit of, of, of a time for that pulse to reach that blood vessel on the scalp surface so here we have a blood vessel showing this pulse artifact it's not Delta but it will show up as Delta on your computer screen when you when you're calculating your data or if you were uh, looking at a Fourier transform a spectral analysis you'd see a bunch of electrical activity a repetitive increase and decrease in that electrical activity in the delta band because this is happening about one time per second uh, again it's happening over here it's probably just happening at 01 
uh, because it's P301 and T501 both showing it. The common electrode between those two is O1. So it's probably O1 electrode is over a, an active blood vessel that's causing this pulse artifact. Now this is an actual ECG or EKG artifact. This is an actual electrical pulse from the heart. We see it in a couple of different locations, most pronounced here at the T3A1 electrode combination. Now here's the same artifact, or a similar artifact, but it's coming from the A1 electrode. So all the uh, other electrodes that are connected to A1 show this very pr pronounced distinctive heartbeat artifact whereas the electrodes that are connected to A2 only show a very small heartbeat artifact. It's still there, but it's not nearly as pronounced. The electrodes connected to the A1 electrode on the left ear are getting this huge um, uh, heartbeat ECG, EKG artifact. Again, this is reference contamination. We talked about that earlier, reference contamination. This is chewing artifact. This is from ch uh, gum chewing or any kind of chewing uh, because chewing produces muscle artifact and this is a very repetitive event. Uh, you can't have people have anything in their mouth. No lozenges, no co uh, cough drops, no hard candy, no gum, no nothing because they'll be chewing or moving that around with their tongue or they'll be swallowing more often. It's just something to avoid uh, for sure. Now, electrodermal artifacts are the result of sweat on the skin changing the conduction and properties under the uh, under and near the electrode sites. You can have a bridging artifact between adjacent electrodes because the sweat causes a salt bridge between the electrolyte or electrode paste of adjacent electrodes. Uh, sometimes you'll just get sweat underneath an electrode, which will also change the conductivity of that electrode and change the signal. And it usually causes these very big electrical shifts in the very slow frequencies. And it, it's something that confounds slow cortical potential training is something we'll talk about. 60 hertz, you can see the 60 hertz because it's very tightly packed together. Remember those waves are happening very, very fast. And so we see what is sometimes described as a fuzzy signal. It's just that there are very densely packed waves happening 60 times per second, whereas most of the waves we look at are happening at less than 30 waves per second. So these waves are happening twice as fast. The other thing that happens with 60 hertz artifact is that it tends to be very consistent in amplitude because it's happening from a, a constant source. It's not muscles tightening or relaxing. It's not brain waves uh, coming from neurons that are changing their behavior constantly. It's a steady, steady input. And if you look at a spectral display developed by a Fourier transform, you see this peak of activity here at 60 hertz, which is right at the end here. And I know you can't read those numbers, but you can see this peak in the spectral display on the right-hand side where you see all of these uh, uh, sensors are showing that uh, electrical activity. And so we don't want to use, we don't want to see that. However, the use of a notch filter routinely is not a particularly good idea because then you can't see whether you've got 60 hertz artifact or not and you can't correct the 60 hertz artifact that you might see. Now, instrument related artifacts uh, there are multiple possibilities for instrument-related artifacts related to design, construction, damage, component deterioration, and so on. Uh, the one we care about the most, of course, we want to make sure we've got good quality amplifiers that are well made. And in the field, there are some really crummy amplifiers out there. Uh, but most of them are pretty good and are pretty well constructed. And so we, we shouldn't have to worry about this too much as long as we have purchased a quality amplifier. Consumer level amplifiers like NeuroSky and some of those, they're just not worth buying because they're just junk. Um, now, you can damage your system through static electricity discharges. So here you are, you've got a client hooked up very nicely, great connections, um, sensor paste and good sensors, and you are moving around and gathering electrical charge 
and you have an electrical electric electrostatic charge in your body and you touch the client and where does that electrostatic charge go it goes right through those nicely connected wires into your amplifier and it can really damage the input stages of your amplifier if it's not well protected uh, some uh, systems use a pre-amplifier that's also can be susceptible to this kind of damage from electrostatic discharge um, so the thing to do is to use a computer technician's wrist strap which you can buy anywhere at any electronics store um, usually less than ten dollars it's a it's a little wrist strap with a metal bead attached to it and that is attached to a wire that plugs into your ground port of your outlet your wall outlet the round ground port of your wall outlet not the slots but the round part and you don't wear that band you just put it somewhere where it's handy and you can touch that metal bead and it has a capacitor in it and so it will discharge your electrostatic charge to the ground but in a controlled manner so you don't feel a shock when you touch that bead uh, but it will discharge you to the ground and then you can touch your client without fear of discharging into the client and of course the client doesn't appreciate the shock either so it's a good idea to do that uh, if you happen to have a handy uh, a tower computer for example with a big metal box that's also grounded you can touch that metal box like on a screw in the corner or something and it'll discharge to the ground because the box itself is also grounded but then you will get a shock so you're better off using a technician's wrist strap because it has a capacitor in it to uh, slow down that discharge uh, component deterioration isn't usually a pro problem anymore uh, we're not connected to this uh, to the uh, line voltage anymore because almost all these systems are uh, battery operated and so we don't uh, have this power source fluctuation problem and most of the computers we're using are laptops nowadays and so each of those has its own power supply that's protected from power source fluctuations so this isn't as much of a problem heat of course is a uh, the enemy of electronic components so you know don't put your amplifier on the hot water radiator or something or out in the car on a hot sunny day with the windows rolled up uh, physical damage you know no matter how frustrated you get don't throw your amplifier against the wall not good for it um, Electrode pop can happen because you've got a poor connection in a 19 channel hookup like this. You might have electrode gel and you might have a, a air bubble in that electrode gel so the charge builds up on the one side of that bubble and then finally jumps across and uh, produces this electrical discharge. It's just a one off thing and in just in one sensor. And so it's not a spike and wave event, it's a electrical discharge called an electrode pop. Uh, it also can be caused by bad or worn electrodes, cor corroded electrode surfaces, broken leads, poor connections, so on. Mismatched electrodes, all kinds of things can cause this. You're not going to run into this very much except in a 19 channel hookup where you might have bubbles in your gel. So we want to get rid of the artifact prior to recording as much as possible. There is going to be artifact in the recording no matter what. People have to blink, people swallow, people cough clear their throat so on and so it's gonna you're gonna have artifact you just have to uh, get rid of as much as you can before the fact and then uh, you can eliminate it both manually and with automatic software based programs after the fact as well mr. Osborne may I be excused my brain is full and so if you feel like your brain is full uh, take a break and then review this presentation at another time